Well, if you were here last Sunday, you know I uh, already preached a Thanksgiving message. But when I did, I said it was uh, a needful thing. You know, a week early. You're never really jumping the gun when you begin to talk about a biblical subject, right? We don't ascribe God's truths to holidays or anymore even to holy days. So again, this morning, we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 in just a moment. You can turn there and kind of park your Bible there if you have it with you and you want to turn. Before I preach today, I'll read this uh, that I've read here before, this proclamation. In, uh, so this Thursday is Thanksgiving Day in America. We're not the only country that has a, I know Canada has a Thanksgiving Day. I think it's in October. And uh, so it's a day set aside, right, to be thankful. And... Uh, when I was a kid and I, you know, read about the, the colonists uh, in Plymouth and everything, and I, I kind of pictured them eating a big turkey, you know, and stuffing and mashed potatoes and gravy and all that stuff, you know. I don't think it was anything like that. Probably kind of a wild game feast, probably some grain, maybe some uh, early versions of uh, what the Indians were eating as far as corn, maize, you know. I don't know. We don't know a lot about the meal itself. But in all truth... Um, that was, you know, we didn't. Have, it's not like they had Thanksgiving in the in the colonies annually every year until this time. In all truth, uh, it wasn't a national holiday until you know the 20th century. Um, and they had a, there was a lady. I don't have her name before me today. That was writing the president. She actually several through office really petitioning, and she was spearheaded uh, getting it to become a national holiday. But uh, it gained a lot of attention in 1863. The idea, and from that point, there were. Even though it wasn't a federal holiday, many of the states and many people continued from the time of Lincoln's uh, proclamation. I always found it very interesting that uh, President Lincoln would, uh, would issue a national declaration for a day of Thanksgiving right in the middle of the Civil War. I mean, a really, I don't know that we can, we can't imagine, uh, you know, what went on in, in the First World War, the Great War, and what happened in the Second War, those of us who didn't live through something like that and you know especially people living in places like London you know daily and nightly sending their children to the countryside but imagine the civil war our country so divided it's so it's so bloody and fighting in the farms and in the barns and in the fields and in the pastures and and uh, and brothers against brothers and cousins and families and and so many young people uh, dying it, it was a, it was such a dark time um, in our country and uh, in the middle, because it was 1861, right, to 1865, and it, it was October 3rd, 1863, that President Lincoln made this declaration. And uh, it, it's amazing how, how deeply he calls us, the people, to repentance of our national sins. And I, I've always really uh, been moved by reading this, and this has nothing to do necessarily with my sermon, I'll preach in a minute. But I'll read the, the proclamation from uh, the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, October 3rd, 1863. And so here it is. The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source which they uh, come, from which they come. Others have been added which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequal magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and to provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations, order has been maintained, the laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict, while that theater has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and navies of the Union. Needful diversions of wealth and of strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The ax has enlarged the borders of our settlements and the mines, as well of iron and coal as of the precious metals, have yielded even more abundantly than heretofore. Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp. The siege and the battlefield in the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. 
No, no, I like this. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience, commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. In testimony whereof I have hereto, hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed, done at the city of Washington this third day of October in the year of our Lord, 1,863, and of the independence of the United States, the 88th, by the President Abraham Lincoln. And so we celebrate Thanksgiving this week, and I'm thankful we're not in the midst of a, a true civil war, a lot of division in this country, but not like uh, they were going through. As I said, our text is from 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, verse 1, 2 Timothy 3, 1. With the Apostle Paul writing, he says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Let's stop. Nobody ever stops there, right? Everybody stops at verse 5 if they're not preaching the whole chapter. So we're stopping there. The Lord and his apostles, both in the New Testament, forecast what the apostate condition of men's hearts will be in the last days. And that's the way this text begins, in the last days. Know this also, in the last days. And, and the Lord did the same thing. Jesus said, you know, that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He's talking about men, about men's hearts, about the apostasy that is within us today, I believe. So Paul does that here. He doesn't forecast the weather here, you know, the spiritual weather, the climate of the last days, nor the political climate, but rather his signs of the times, as we might call them, here reveal the pervading wickedness of men's hearts and lives. What are the real signs of the times? Is it just all, you know, earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes, and eclipses, and blood moons, and wars? I guess there's a place for those things. Jesus said that there'll be earthquakes in diverse places, seismos, shakings of the earth, right? But this is our text this morning, and these are signs of the times. And actually, I think that they're the, the strongest indication of the fact that we're in the last days is the apostasy in men's hearts, the condition of men, yep. not the condition of the world or nature or politics or nations. Not that those things don't play a part. And this is our text. The Apostle Paul paints a picture of the last days being a time when men have become basically lovers of pleasure, lovers of self. And he goes on to say some of those things. We read just the two verses. But he shows us that men will be what I call, uh, what I would say are self-absorbed, self-serving, vicious, right? Perilous times that the word there, I guess, indicates some sort of fierceness. Read that from several sources. But vicious men, lacking affection, and what he says here, unthankful. That's how he describes. And so everything he's saying is about men. 
about men, about people. Unthankful. And so I stopped short here in verse 2 purposefully because I want to consider this one thing for this morning. That men will be unthankful. And so this passage, I mean, these five verses, I didn't read them all, but these five verses are, I would say they're a warning passage and they're alarming and they do fit. And not, not, not that they haven't always fit. I mean, since the fall, man has been evil. Men have been wicked, right? And it didn't take men long to, uh, to even commit what we consider among ourselves to be the worst crime, which was murder. Cain and Abel. But we do definitely see men putting the foot to the gas pedal, sort of, on these things. That as men, we will be in these last times, very marketedly so. I mean, it would be visible, pointed, unthankful. That as men, we are so often unthankful, and that unthankfulness is pervading in our hearts and lives in this very time. Someone might say, well, that's not too big of a deal, is it? You know, I mean, is it really a, a, a serious issue? Sh should I devote an entire sermon to it alone, you know, to the sin of unthankfulness? Well, let me say that, you know, we do need to preach about sin because that, that's going to show us the need for the gospel every time we do. And that ought to be our intent every time we do. You know, because there, I, I, I've had people ask me, you know, our preacher, are you going to preach uh, on sin? I said, yeah, well, I'm for or against, amen. Well, my flesh is for it, but God's against it. And so here we go digging into scripture. One of the pervading sins of these times that I believe we're living in. Let's look at ourselves today. One of the things that Paul accuses of and says that's going to be happening among us and to us and within us in this very time is that we will be unthankful. And immediately we might say, well, yeah, I know a lot of people like that. Or immediately we might say, well, yeah, young people today, you know, young people. And it's not just young people. And it's not just somebody you know. That unthankfulness is a sin against God is certain. Now that is made clear by its inclusion here. We could go to a lot of various texts to confirm it. I don't think I need to. I think that point we would all agree upon that it is, that it is sinful. But like most sins, they're all, it's always hard to see them in ourselves. I, I'm not going to preach on pride today, but it's impossible, I think, to preach on sin without talking about pride. I mean, it's, that's not impossible, but it becomes necessary in my mind because pride is certainly a root sin. It's sort of attached to all of them. It's, it's kind of behind them. And, and the unique thing about pride is that it is, it is its own protector. Amen. It is. It's its own protector. You know, confession, they say confession is good for the soul. What's better than that? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And so confession is not just the doctrine of the Roman church, right? I mean, you may not need to confess to me. and We're not going to do that. But you certainly need to confess to him because he died for our sins. He is our great high priest. He is a propitiation for our sins. But we're never going to confess our sins until we recognize that sin within us. And I just read from Lincoln's you know, proclamation. He said we need to be uh, penitent. He talked about repentance, okay, of our national sins and transgressions. Well, it becomes even more personal than that. Most of us would look around today and say, boy, this nation needs to repent. Very few of us will look at uh, and come into the, into the assembly, into the church, and, and before we leave, repent of anything, let alone the sin of unthankfulness. It's not as if the scriptures do not condemn it elsewhere, as I say. And true thankfulness and gratitude, I mean, we want to preach on the positive side, which I kind of did last week. There's some beautiful Proverbs, some beautiful psalms, I think of. The, the psalms, the songs, the Hebrew songs, psalms are just so full of thanksgiving, entering into his courts with thanksgiving, praising him. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise him in every way, right? Even upon the high sounding cymbals, praise him from the mountaintops, praising him in the valleys, thanking him. So thankfulness and gratitude toward God is always encouraged and commended throughout the scriptures. But I think we need to go at it from this, this perspective as well sometimes. So I want to I wanna make a few points this morning. First of all, that unthankfulness is sinful. It is. Now we do often, you know, we reprove it in young people. We reprove it in our children. 
what do you say, right? Somebody gives them something, they're like, yeah, that's what they say, right? You're like, what do you say? Oh, thank you, you know. In Paul's epistle to the Romans, in chapter one, where he reproves and exposes the humanistic rejectors of Christ, he reminds us that reprobate men are unthankful. Even while having a knowledge of God that they have suppressed, it is suppressed within them. And while they, they see visibly his wonderful works of creation and while living in it and experiencing life and benefiting from what we might call his common graces, they remain completely unthankful. He says in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. So in this text, he actually ties this, this phrase here to basically their, their lack of response to the gospel or response to God, that they neither were they thankful. And so true gratitude is, is only experienced in our hearts because of our faith response to the gospel. That's when we become, we realize what God has done we see who he is and who we are and how undeserving we are and gratitude springs forth. So the thankfulness is sinful. Secondly, I wanna say, and I don't think it's gonna be hard for me to establish, that unthankfulness is pervading in our time. I believe it's, it's rampant. Unthankfulness has existed in man's heart since the fall. It's not as if we've come up with a new sin, you know, we've devised something. Modern man did not create this evil, but you could argue that modern man has sought to perfect it and certainly expand it greatly. Our day, I would say, is often defined by ingratitude, which is evidenced in so many ways. Think about it. It is evidenced often by man's sense of entitlement. It is evidence, unthankfulness is evidenced by man's constant tendency to complain. It is evidenced by man's lack of worship and prayer. It is evidenced that perhaps this morning by empty pews, crisp new Bible pages. It is evidenced when we, by a lack of singing, a lack of desire to sing with joy to the Lord. It is evidenced by our lust and envy and theft and greed and dissatisfaction. It is evidenced by the violence toward one another in our world today. Unthankfulness is evidenced and expressed, expressed virtually every time we choose to sin against God. I said it by envy and, and th lust and theft and greed. Now, how is envy evidence of our unthankfulness? Now, I said complaining, but how is envy evidence of our unthankfulness? So I want you to think about this. If I took Joshua and Judah to Dollar General this afternoon and I gave them each $5 to spend, do you think they would be thankful? I would hope so. One thing's for sure, they'd be you know, a little excited, right? Of course, Judah's got some of his own money at times now, but he'd still take it. But how do you think, Joshua's not here this morning, so I can pick on him and use him as an example, but how do you think he'd feel if I took him and Judah to Dollar General this afternoon, and I gave Joshua that $5, and I turned around in front of him, and I gave Judah the ten, a 10 or 20. How would that 11-year-old son of mine feel about that? You see, envy changes our attitude. It changes our gratitude. Be content with such things as you have. Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. For one, do we believe in the providence of God? You know, it was in that proclamation I just read, right? Do you believe his hand, that you're in his hands today? Do you believe that his eyes are upon you today? Do you believe he's slumbering and sleeping or that he is, he is concerned with you? Are you, are you his child? It has been passed down related that Andrew Carnegie left a million dollars for one of his relatives who in return 
after Carnegie's death would often openly curse, openly complain about his deceased relative. Because Carnegie had left $365 million to public charities, our library here in town is the Carnegie Library. One of his last living relatives received a million dollars, which would have been great, I guess, if he didn't know that Carnegie had left $365 million to charity. I want to establish thirdly this morning that God is good and deserving and that he desires thankfulness. He desires gratitude. The Bible tells us he's looking for people to praise him. He's looking for people to worship him, looking for spiritual worshipers. And I don't know that he always finds one when he's looking at me. Psalm 100 verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Paul wrote to the Colossians, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body and be ye thankful. Again, David wrote in the Psalms 30 verse 4, sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. I've made reference to the words of James, the brother of the Lord, who reminded us that every good and perfect gift cometh down from above. Don't forget where goodness comes from. Don't forget where graciousness comes from. Don't forget where blessings, where life itself. I know we focus so often on what we don't have. That seems to be our focus. And what we want. Once in a while, I just, I mean, I'm not a big Rolling Stones fan by far. Once in a while, I just start singing to my kids, though, you don't always get what you want. They don't know it's a song. Yeah. You don't always get what you want. I sing it to them all the time. They haven't caught on, right? But I'm not much better sometimes. My attitude towards God, God desires people that are, he desires to see gratitude within us. He wants to produce that by his gospel. This gospel is very effective at doing that, I believe. The gospel is the solution to the problem on our day. Men cannot really be grateful towards God until his goodness is seen in Christ and until our sin is revealed to us through his gospel. When we receive redeeming grace, it works toward genuine gratitude. This grace led Charles Weigel to write the great hymn, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus, in the midst of very dark times in his own life, when his marriage had fallen apart, he lost then, and then his, he not, his wife not only left him, and then she passed, and so did his, his son, whom she had taken with, him, with her. He sat at his piano and wrote the word, all the stanzas to that song about 20 minutes as he wept. No one ever, ever cared for me like Jesus. This grace, you and I, I pray that you've experienced Faith was the difference in the thankful leper who was cleansed. You think about the 10 lepers that come to Jesus and Luke's gospel. and Well, they're excited going away, right? I mean, usually what do we do when we receive a blessing? We run with it, you know? I mean, if we get a blessing in the moment, we run with it. And that's kind of what we want for our kids, right? We give them something, man. We love to watch them play. We love to watch them eat. We love to watch them enjoy. We also hope that what we're doing as parents and grandparents produces some gratitude, right? God's the same. I mean, much more so, and he's much more deserving. And he sent his son. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. We're undeserving of that. So 10 lepers came and they were cleansed. And they all went their way. But one comes back in Luke chapter 17. What's the difference there? I don't expect the world, the unbelieving, as I say, they can celebrate uh, you know, a national holiday. They may sit around the table and thank dad for being a hard worker, mom for being a hard worker, for cooking, you know, and slaving in the kitchen all night around pies. I remember my mom used to make the mo one, del great pies, delicious pies, but also they were really beautiful. She would, she made pies and she did the lattice, you know, I'm talking about fruit pies with lattice. She wanted to use real butter. And she had to have a chair in the kitchen right in front of the oven. You know why? 
Because she sat there, right? And she'd open and she'd brush lightly and she'd close and she'd watch them. And I'm like, I don't care what it looks like, Mom. I mean, when she wanted it to look right and she'd get that big granulated sugar and she knew when to put it on on top. She could make, if she, when she was younger, she made a pie to look like you wouldn't believe. I've seen her sit there during the whole time process of one bacon and br have that melted butter and brushing it on two or three times and getting it golden and the coloring. And then she got it so pretty you didn't want to eat it, but you know, I would, right? What kind of care? So we can thank mom and dad, thank one another, and that's, that's good. It's not always wrong to, you know, we're not here to worship men or praise men, but we're also not here to insult them. And I, I know this, if we lack gratitude toward one another, that's a reflection more than likely that we lack gratitude towards God. So I, it's okay to be thankful to people who have expressed God's goodness through, through them to you. That's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. But it's more than that. And I'm not talking about the holiday. I'm talking about the Christian life, the Christian heart. But we're living in the last days. And I ask you, when the Lord or his apostles describe men in the last days, and we read their words, it would be easy to assign all of those things to men in the world. Men in the world will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. You know, it would be nice if we escaped all these things the moment we first believed, completely escaped them, I mean, in our physical lives. It would be really nice because that disobedient to parents thing. I mean, you know, when any of my kids confess Christ, bam, that's over. <laughs> so if that one's not over in them, are these other things, am I rid of these things or is God still washing me of these things, this side of heaven and this physical body? It would be easy for us to assign all of these things, as I say, to men in the world. But in truth, we follow suit in the times so often, and it is so difficult to see it in ourselves. It has been said that no one likes an ingrate. You know, do you like an unthankful person? What about a person who's just never thankful for nothing, takes everything for granted, me, me, me. I mean, do, do, no one likes an ingrate. No one likes an ungrateful person. But truthfully, even if we've said that, yeah. most of us love at least one ungrateful person very much yeah. in that we love ourselves. <laughs> yeah, right so I would say today that I hate, an in, I hate ingrates except for this one. <laughs> <laughs> so what should we do? We sing a song that says, take time to be holy. Well, yeah. let's take time to be thankful. Yeah. Let's do it on purpose. Because actually, most things that we don't do on purpose, we don't do at all. And I'm not saying it's a work of the flesh. God is giving us the desire to do it. And that's why I'm preaching on it this morning. Let's take time to be thankful again today. You know what we're going to do Wednesday night here, the night before Thanksgiving? We're going to have testimony opportunity. And I like the fact that we do not have everybody jumping up on these testimonies. We've gone back to having Wednesday night testimony meetings. Usually it's just one or two people. But I'm going to just designate it this Wednesday night. It's Thanksgiving testimony. Anything you want to give God thanks for uh, over the last year or in your life or your salvation or your spiritual experience or your, just your physical life and your family, you know, if you're here Wednesday night, come prepared to, to say a few things about that if you want to. But this morning, we've established or the scriptures establish, and I think we all believe it, that unthankfulness is a terrible sin and one that permeates these last days and one that is not only found in the unsaved, but one that we need to be careful of in our own hearts and confess and repent and be purposefully thankful to God in heaven above. God is good all the time. Amen. Let's stand together today for, for dismiss a prayer. Be thankful purposefully this Thanksgiving and today and every day.